Welcome everybody to another COVID-19 update by FuseNet. Uh, this briefing will follow a similar outline to what we've done in the past. We'll take a look at the key messages for events related to COVID-19 over the past two weeks. And then we'll look a little bit more closely at the status of the pandemic, including what is known about COVID-19 cases across the countries we're monitoring and testing. And then we'll look at movement relative to typical levels and how that's evolving and talk a little bit more about our country of focus for this briefing, which is Nigeria. So starting with the key messages, as of November 23rd, which was yesterday, there were approximately 723,000 known cases of COVID-19 across the countries that FuseNet monitors and about 18,600 associated deaths. deaths. Though, of course, testing across these countries remains low and the true scale of the outbreak is likely higher. We are starting to see that the COVID-19 cases that are being reported daily are now outpacing slightly uh, the number of recoveries daily. And this is a slight uh, trend change from September where we were seeing those two things more even. There's a risk of further COVID-19 spread in the storm affected areas of Central America, given the crowding of populations uh, in shelters as a result of displacement from those storms. And in the case of some shelters, a lack of access to clean water. In early November, the Minister of Health in Honduras reported that there was a 33% positivity rate amongst the tests that were carried out in shelters um, by November 6th. And population movement, when we look at some of the key indirect impacts on acute food insecurity, we are seeing that population movement is increasing across FuseNet monitored countries, as is assessed by cell phone data by the University of Washington. Though two of the key exceptions to this where movement relative to typical levels remains particularly low is Guatemala and Honduras. And for our country of focus this week, we're looking at Nigeria and the country's economy has officially entered a recession, um, contracting for the second consecutive quarter. And we anticipate that this lower economic activity is driving lower casual labor opportunities, um, including amongst those who are relying on some of the sectors that contracted, such as manufacturing and food and accommodation services. And the lower income from lower demand through these sectors, in addition to lower remittance inflows and higher staple food prices, alongside some of the impacts of flooding and conflict are together driving higher than normal levels of acute food insecurity in this country. So turning to the state of the pandemic, this chart is again showing the number of daily COVID-19 cases in orange that are being reported across FuseNet monitored countries. And the seven day average of these new daily cases is shown by the green line uh, with total deaths shown in blue. And what we're seeing in terms of trends is that there's a slight uptick in the daily average of cases being reported to about 4,000 cases a day now, uh, a little bit up from the 2,500 to 3,000 that were observed per day in much of September and October. And in terms of these cases broken down into active cases, recovered cases, and those that have resulted in death, we are continuing to see that a relatively low proportion of total cases remain active. The high majority are recovered cases, so we're seeing a slight uptick in uh, active cases outpacing recoveries. And there are currently about 166,000 active cases across these 29 countries, up somewhat from the same time last month at about 153,000 active cases. There are some countries, though, that are reporting relatively greater increases in COVID-19 cases, and two of these include Uganda and Kenya, and we're looking at their reported cases um, on these charts on this slide. On the left is Uganda, and you can see that the reported daily cases is now averaging closer to about 300 uh, cases per day, higher than their peak in August, September, which was closer to about 150 to 200 cases per day. 
And on the right, looking at Kenya, they are now reporting around 1,000 cases a day, um, up from their previous peak in July at closer to uh, 500 cases per day. And when we look at some of the additional information that's provided by the Kenyan government, we see a relatively high positivity, uh, testing positivity rate, and we see the number of new cases outpacing uh, recovered cases. So here on the left, we're looking at the daily reported COVID-19 cases and recoveries from November 17th through November 21st. And the new daily cases are shown in red and the recoveries uh, during the same day are shown in blue. And we see the new cases uh, outpacing by quite a bit the new recoveries on each of those days. And on the right is looking at the daily tests that are reported um, from Kenya, the bar itself representing total tests. And in the red, those tests that have uh, turned out positive and in black, those that have turned out negative. And over November 17th through 19th, dates for which uh, data is currently available, we're seeing a testing positivity rate around 17%. So Kenya is attributing the increase in reported cases primarily to an increase in testing, but there's also some tightening of restrictions ongoing in the country, including lengthening the time of the curfew, uh, suspending large gatherings and requiring restaurants to close at 9 p.m. Overall, the movement and labor opportunities for poor households are assessed to be higher than they were in mid-2020, but the overall lower economic activity is still expected to be limiting income amongst many. And as always, we would reiterate that testing across the countries monitored by FuseNet remains low, and therefore the trends on the status of the pandemic should be treated with caution. Here we're looking at the number of daily COVID-19 tests per 1,000 people as of November 22nd. And across the countries that FuseNet covers, testing is at less than one person per 1,000 people um, as of late November. And one interesting point that we might note related to testing is that several countries have now opened up their international uh, travel, their air borders for international travel. And many governments or airlines are requiring a negative test in order to depart on those flights. And this includes in Burkina Faso, DRC, Malawi, Mali, Sudan, and Uganda. So this opens up the possibility that we could see a decline in the testing positivity rate um, if we were to see this self-selection bias, meaning that those who are most likely to get te tested or more likely to get tested could include those who now require a negative result to travel. So this could potentially skew some of the positivity rates and something that we are um, looking at alongside all of the COVID statistics. And of course, concern for continued COVID-19 spread exists across the globe. The one area we would highlight this week for heightened risk is Central America, given the impacts of the storms, Ida and Iota. Here, this map is looking at the total millimeters of rainfall that were received across the region between November 2nd and 18th um, in the shading of yellow to blue. And in many areas, this amount of rainfall is upwards of 300% or more of average rainfall for that time period. And the paths of the storms are shown in red. Uh, the first, Ida, traveling through Nicaragua and Honduras, and then Iota traveling similarly through Nicaragua and then um, Honduras and El Salvador. And overall, these storms have impacted millions of people. It's estimated that across Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, nearly 500,000 people are residing in temporary shelters. And the crowding at the shelters, and in some cases, the lack of clean water and hygienic conditions are worrisome for health, including for the spread of COVID-19. Here on the right are the results of surveys that were conducted in Honduras following Hurricane Ida. The top asks if 
the individuals surveyed, um, which were 1,326 individuals, if they are currently in a temporary shelter as a result of the storm. And the results are stratified by areas that are assessed to be moderately, highly, or critically impacted by the storm. Though on the far right, in total, overall, about 43% uh, of those surveyed were currently in a temporary shelter. And in the, on the bottom, uh, about 36% assessed that their conditions at the shelter uh, were not hygienic. And there have also been um, reports of about half of the temporary shelters in Guatemala not having access to running water. There have also been COVID-19 tests giving, given in some, but not all, of the shelters. In Honduras, the Minister of Health reported a 33% uh, positivity rate amongst tests carried out in shelters by November 8th, um, and about a 5% positivity rate recorded in Guatemala amongst tests given out in some of their shelters. And turning to some of the indirect impacts in terms of movement relative to typical levels, here we're checking in on the cell phone data that is analyzed by the University of Washington to assess movement relative to typical levels. The purple bold line here is the global average, and then each of the gray lines represent one of FuseNet monitored countries, starting first in West Africa. And what we're seeing is that broadly movement has remained relatively steady over the past uh, couple of months with movement now within the range of typical levels, in particular for Cameroon, uh, Burkina Faso, and Niger and Nigeria. We see somewhat lower movement relative to typical levels in the other countries, but still above the global average uh, as of early November. In East Africa, a fairly similar story. All countries are showing movement higher than the global average, uh, though Uganda, in Uganda, movement remains relatively lower than the rest of the countries in the region, uh, closer to the global average at less than 20% of typical levels. In Southern Africa, movement in Zimbabwe is now assessed to be above typical levels, where as in Madagascar, DRC, Mozambique, and Malawi, it is somewhat below typical levels, though still above the global average. And the trend is more stark in Yemen and Afghanistan, where movement is assessed to be above their typical levels at about 10 to 15 percent, where it has been for the past couple of months, uh, well above the global average for movement. And where conversely we're seeing a bit of a different story is in Central America and the Caribbean. Here we continue to see movement relatively lower than what is typical. Um, though in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Haiti, this is somewhat above the global average, whereas movement remains uh, well below typical levels in Guatemala and Honduras, at about 30 to 40 percent what is normal for this time for these countries. Overall, we assess that this is reflective across FuseNet countries of increased engagement in labor opportunities that were relatively less available in mid-2020 given the movement restrictions, but that the overall lower economic demand, um, in particular for many service industries, still continues to drive lower income um, earning opportunities for many poor households. And now turning to the country of focus for today, we're going to look a little bit more at Nigeria. On the left hand side of this slide is the daily COVID-19 cases reported in Nigeria in orange and the seven day moving average in green. Overall, we're seeing that cases are continuing to be lower than they were during the peak in June to August, currently at around 200 cases reported per day. And when we look at the location of uh, the cases here on the right from the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, this map varies somewhat from week to week, but overall we're continuing to see COVID-19 cases reported broadly across, uh, across the country. The Nigerian economy has now slipped into a recession as GDP has contract contracted uh, for the second consecutive quarter. 
as a result of the measures that were put in place to slow the spread of the virus, uh, both domestically and globally. Here on the left-hand side of the slide, we're looking at Nigeria's real GDP growth from quarter one of 2019 through quarter three of 2020. And you can see that in the first five quarters on the chart, uh, Nigeria's GDP growth year on year was around two to 2.5%, whereas we've seen a significant decline in uh, quarter two and quarter three of 2020. And in terms of some of the sectors that we've seen contract, the oil sector fell about 14% year on year and non-oil sectors also contracted, including manufacturing, trade and accommodation for food and, um, and travel. And we're anticipating that this is impacting casual labor opportunities as well, um, from which many poor households derive income. And while crude oil um, contributes typically around 10% to GDP, it accounts for about 90% of foreign exchange earnings. And the lower foreign exchange earnings are contributing to a depreciation of the currency, which is what is shown on the graph here on the right. Although these data are only available through October, um, some additional information has suggested a further uh, depreciation of the currency in November. And in addition to the lower income earned through lower casual labor opportunities, we've also seen a sharp decline in remittance inflows to Nigeria as reported by the central bank. Uh, these are official remittances, so they don't show the statistics for what we expect are a relatively high amount of unofficial remittances as well. But still the trend here shows a pretty sharp decline to about 3.3 billion in remittances in the second quarter of 2020, uh, the lowest amount on, on their record since 2008. And in addition to the lower income through uh, casual labor anticipated as well as lower remittances, we're also seeing staple food prices continue at above average uh, levels, uh, in part due to the depreciation of the currency that is putting upward pressure on prices. Here on the right is the price for maize in Kano, and the gray bars show the five-year average of prices. The blue line is last year's prices, and the black line is um, the current year prices. When the black line becomes dashed, this is representing FuseNet's projection. So you can see that prices are currently well above average, and we anticipate that this will continue to be the case throughout um, at least early to mid-2021. And we also anticipate that imported rice prices will remain similarly above average. So the combination of the lower income as well as the higher staple food prices are anticipated to be lowering poor households food access um, across much of Nigeria. So as we turn to the overall food security outcomes, here on the left-hand side, you can see FuseNet's projected food security outcomes for February to May in Nigeria. Broadly speaking, the areas where we expect the most severe acute food insecurity, the key driver is not COVID-19, it's conflict, and in some cases, uh, flooding. We expect that this will continue in uh, 2021 and disrupt households' access to typical livelihoods, driving stress and crisis outcomes. Though the impacts of COVID-19 are exasperating the situation, in particular, the lower labor opportunities and the higher state food prices um, that are driving up overall needs. And when we look at what we anticipate for fiscal year 2021, overall we expect that during their timing of peak needs, which is between July and September, that between six and seven million people will be in need of humanitarian food assistance. This is similar to fiscal year um, 2020, but above the five-year average. And we do anticipate that some worst affected areas will be an emergency in Borno State um, during the projection period. <laughs> 